My husband Tom is on the local city tree board. He is very concerned about emerald ash borer, especially since this insect has now been found in a community less than 60 miles from where we live. I wanted to find out more about EAB, so I called on a friend, Joe Selesnik, who is an extension forester to fill me in. Then we'll travel to Marshall, Minnesota to find out what their community and all of us can do to get ready for this awful pest and help prevent its spread. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided by Heartland Motor Company, providing service to Minnesota and the Dakotas for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering ASIRA, pioneers in bringing state-of-the-art technology to our rural communities. Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. And by friends of Prairie Yard and Garden, a community of supporters like you who engage in the long-term growth of the series. To become a friend of Prairie Yard and Garden, visit pioneer.org forward slash PYG. Initials have gotten to be so popular in our culture. My kids will roll their eyes when I ask them what LOL means on my phone message. Using initials for words is even common in the plant world. The people in my generation will remember DED, which was short for Dutch Elm Disease. This was a terrible disease that wiped out so many of the beautiful elms that shaded our homes and city streets. Today we're going to learn about EAB with Joe Selesnik and then find out what one city is doing to prepare for that major tree issue. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, Mary. Glad to be here. Joe, what is EAB or what does that stand for? EAB is emerald ash borer. It's an insect that uh, is killing ash trees throughout much of the eastern U.S., slowly working its way west. It came to the U.S. in the mid to late 1990s in the Detroit, Michigan area. And from there, it gradually spread. It, and they didn't figure out it was there or what was causing problems with their ash trees until 2002. It, it damages them initially and eventually will kill them. What does an ash tree look like? So if people have it in their yard, what they, can they know in order to identify it? Okay. Well, there's two things that people should know. First is that ash is opposite. That is the branches come across opposite from each other. Uh, you can see it on this one. On this one, you might notice there used to be a branch here. It broke off, so it's a, a little tricky. So the branches come off opposite of each other. The leaves come off opposite of each other. But the leaves are compound leaves. This is a compound leaf, not a simple leaf. And a compound leaf has multiple leaflets. And the way you tell a compound leaf versus a simple leaf is where's the bud? The bud is at the base of the leaf overall. Most of the things that are opposite with compound leaves will be ash. What does emerald ash borer damage look like on their trees? Okay, on the overall tree, if you're looking at the big picture, it'll start with some dieback from the top. The insects like to feed near the top first and then gradually work their way down. So the larvae of emerald ash borer, the little caterpillars, they feed under the bark. And what they do is they go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Serpentine, it's clearly back and forth in their feeding as they develop. This tree was hit by lots and lots of emerald ash borers. So early on in the infestation, when there's just one or two in the tree, we'll see this. Later on, we'll see galleries, feeding galleries going everywhere. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that this girdles the tree so the top uh, gets starved of water 
and nutrients from the soil. So then the roots get starved of the sugar that's coming down from the leaves. So it's, a, it's kind of both the top and the bottom get starved in different ways. What do the um, adults and also the larvae look like? Okay, the adults are a metallic green. I've never actually seen one. I've just, I've seen little samples in a vial, and, but I've never actually seen one. Usually the metallic green insects that I see are the six spotted tiger beetle you might be familiar with. Very pretty, very pretty. And some uh, metallic wood borers. Uh, so I've never actually seen the adult of emerald ash borer. The larvae are kind of a creamy white segmented. They've got these bell-shaped segments, and uh, that's one thing that's really distinct about them is that bell shape. Because again, some of these native borers look a little bit similar. And the other key identifier for the larvae for EAB, are they have these two little prongs sticking out the backside. They're called urogomphi, technically. Uh, and they're only on EAB. You don't see them on our native ash borers that might look similar. How do the emerald ash borers travel or spread? You know, the adults can fly, generally maybe they fly about a half a mile. They could fly up to 10 miles. Generally it's firewood. Firewood or pallet wood. Uh, sometimes if the bark is still on the wood, that can cause problems. That can transport insects hundreds of miles. Buy it where you burn it. I, I love that phrase. Uh, it's very simple and straightforward because even out here on the prairie, there's enough trees that, that there, are firewood, there is firewood available from local vendors. So if people have ash in their wood pile, they could actually be harboring? They could. Uh, up to two years, I believe, is how long it could take a, the insect to develop under the bark. Uh, the other part is, if it, with a piece of firewood, it is gradually drying out. But uh, if it's fresh firewood, yes, there could be an insect under there. If people have a beautiful ash tree and they really want to save it, is there anything that they can do? Sure, sure. There are a couple of insecticide options. Uh, varying, there's a lot of details here, varying effectiveness, uh, varying cost. One is called imidacloprid very common, incredibly common. Uh, you can buy it at most garden centers or it can be applied professionally. That one's very simple. You mix it up according to the directions, apply it at the base of the tree, let the tree take it up. And that is pretty effective. It's, it's not the best, but it's, it's pretty good. And homeowners can do it and it's fairly inexpensive. There's one related to that called Dinotefuran that can also be applied to the soil, but actually that one is often applied as a bark spray. And uh, it gets, it moves a lot quicker. It gets absorbed through the bark, moves a lot quicker to the top of the tree. Uh, otherwise, it works pretty similar to the imidacloprid. The third one has the active ingredient called emamectin benzoate. And that one can only be applied by professionals. And that one is applied as an injection into the stem. Now that one is very effective, 99 plus percent effective at killing EAB adults and some of the larvae. So uh, it might be worth your while. And the prices, because of competition, have come down. The emamectin benzoate also has a two-year residual. The imidacloprid, the dinotefuran, really are only a one-year residual. You have to treat every year. Where can people go or what can they do if they need more information on EAB? Uh, for more information, I'd say go to your State Department of Agriculture website or the State Department of Forestry, and it's a little different in North Dakota versus Minnesota versus South Dakota. Uh, in North Dakota, we have the, state, the North Dakota Forest Service. In Minnesota, you have the Minnesota DNR Forestry Division. And in South Dakota, the forestry program is actually part of the State Department of Agriculture. I would also recommend uh, the Extension Office, either in your county if you have one, or in your state uh, at the regional level. Well, thank you so very much for all of the great information. Oh, you're welcome. Glad to be here. I'm with Mayor Bob Burns from the City of Marshall. And Bob, why does the city feel it's important to have a lot of trees here? 
Well, you know, trees make neighborhoods, and uh, the um, trees are not a natural part of uh, of this area, so we introduce trees, and you know, it does uh, provide shade, and it makes neighborhoods, and um, it really just makes the community more livable. You also have a planting project that was along a highway corridor, is that correct? Well, we have a number of uh, planting projects every year that we do, but the, the one that I'm actually really interested in is along our Saratoga Street, both the street and then there's a boulevard and then a bike trail, and we uh, deliberately planted a variety of different species of trees there, and, our, and then we labeled them, we identified them, and our purpose there was that really to provide some education for homeowners and people in the community that um, really uh, may not be familiar with different species of trees but uh, can look at walk down the bike trail uh, look at different trees what the shape they are how they appear and then help them make a selection for their own yards. Why did you use a bunch of different kinds of trees rather than have them all look nice and uniform and neat along the road? Well, we're really interested in diversity of tree plantings in the, in, uh, the community. And of course, we're anticipating the arrival of uh, emerald ash borer, uh, which will be devastating for our tree population. Over 50% of our, uh, of our trees in the community are ash trees. So. Uh, so we really have been working to uh, diversify and introduce plantings uh, in anticipation of emerald ash borer arriving. How did you decide what trees to plant out there? Well, a number of considerations. One is, will they grow here? I mean, we're, we're in a windy environment and uh, we want trees that will be durable so that they can withstand the, the wind. But we also looked at other factors like, uh, our, does that tree, when it uh, grows and matures, will it cause any problems with visibility around an intersection? Will there any, be any safety? Will it cover up any signage uh, that is along that roadway? And when we're in a boulevard where we, you know, space is constrained, we want to be sure that the, the root mass isn't going to interfere with either the curb on one side or the bike trail on the other side. And, you know, in many cases that could be a sidewalk in front of a home. You know, it's along a street, so we really needed trees that and species that, um, you know, can take the heat that would be reflected off of the street, uh, you know, the snow that would be uh, plowed off of the road and perhaps some salt. So we need, need uh, trees that uh, provide that durability. So, so that's why we selected a variety of trees. And, and one of the, the species that we did introduce there is uh, uh, um, elm trees. And of course, elms uh, 50 years ago in this community uh, uh, we lost most of the elms, and um, that they were replaced mainly with green ash trees. And we don't want to repeat that uh, that again, where we replace the ash trees with only one, or predominantly one species of trees. So, for that reason, we have you know a number of different types of oak trees that are there, locust trees that are there, uh, elms, uh, and actually it's a Princeton elm. There are probably newer varieties now are, um, and more choices of elms that are resistant to Dutch elm disease. And there's several other varieties of, of trees that are along there too. But they're all identified and now they've been in a few years so you can see the different sizes and growth patterns of those trees. So people just in the community can bike or can walk along and look and see what the different species are and then maybe even figure out what they want to plant in their own yard. Exactly, because I think, uh, you know, most Many, many people, uh, when they're selecting a, a tree, it's very small, and you know it's hard for a lot of people to envision what is that tree going to be like when it's, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the road. And many times, you know, you know it uh, turns out differently. It's either a different size or shape, or you know, you know sometimes we end up with the the right tree in the wrong place, and we don't. We want to help people to avoid some of those those mistakes. We actually have a very uh, dedicated um, uh, park staff then, and our uh, public ways uh, um, staff also have helped a lot with that. So, you know, it t took watering, you know, for the first year, but, uh, you know, that's not practical to do beyond year one. So that's another good reason for selection of trees that really do not require a lot of maintenance. I think all communities that, you know, are, are preparing for the effects of emerald ash borer. And so, 
you know, what we've done and what I'd encourage others, others to do is um, it is coming and to anticipate that and it will be devastating. And there, while there are some treatments, there's probably no practical treatment for citywide. We look at a park like this and it you know, wouldn't be feasible to do a, a chemical treatment for that. So really the best thing we can do is start now with planting different varieties of trees so that when the ash trees all need to be removed, that there's other trees that have a head start. I have a question. What plants do you recommend for starting a butterfly garden? You know, just uh, think of the bloom times and try to cover a lot of the seasons so that you can take care of the butterflies when they need the nectar to feed on. I'm going to advise uh, a lot of native prairie plants because they're uh, easy to take care of, they're adapted to our climate, and they require a minimum of watering. Early in the season, we'll have butterfly weed, which is a milkweed. The milkweeds are important plants for the monarch butterfly, and that'll get some uh, blooms early in the summer. Then uh, we'll go into uh, Rebecca's, which are uh, like black-eyed Susan, brown-eyed Susan. That'll get the, a little later in the season. Late summer, early fall, and that's when the, the butterflies, you know, the monarchs are getting ready to migrate and they're feeding heavily. And then we'll get asters. There's many varieties of aster. Uh, New England aster, smooth aster, sky blue aster. But there's, uh, you know, over 100 varieties of asters you could use. And then the goldenrod, like the aster has many, many varieties, you know, over a hundred. Uh, stiff goldenrod, elm leaf goldenrod is another nice one. Uh, showy goldenrod, just to mention a few. And then, uh, you know, the latest uh, members of the sunflower family, I would uh, plant some of those. They'll be late in the season. And also, just a side light, we're, we'd like to be taking care of a lot of the pollinators now. So we just encourage planting a lot of flowers on your property as much as you can to take care of the butterfly and all the other pollinators. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chaska, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. I'm with Preston Stensrud, Park Superintendent for the City of Marshall. And tell us about yourself and what is your job? With the park superintendent for the city of Marshall, uh, I take care of all the parks, obviously, baseball fields, bike trails, oversee operations for our aquatic center, and then also our Red Baron Arena and Expo, which is a two-sheet ice arena. We have seven full-time staff, and we hire on average about 14 seasonal help um, just for doing all the maintenance from mowing, um, tree care, flowers, um, anything that needs to be done out in these spaces, basically, so. How is your job tied into the emerald ash borer problem that could be coming? Um, in the last, I'm gonna say about 10 years, we have really started focusing on planting um, many different species and not in mass plantings, um, so that, you know, in the future, if we get these, uh, diseases or bugs that it's not going to take out a whole group of trees at once. It might be, you know, every fifth one instead of 25 in a row. And then just removing unhealthy trees that, you know, would be um, susceptible to the bug um, and just maintaining the good healthy trees and just focusing on those more as a priority. How did you decide what trees to take out now already? Um, for the ash trees we've been taking out is just strictly age and on health. Um, a lot of them are getting the rot or where they break easily in the winds. Um, so instead of trying to um, just keep pruning and maintaining them, um, we're just trying to kind of eliminate them. So that way it gives us a little head start instead of total removal when the emerald ash borer gets here. So, so um, how did you get the funding to plant a lot of the new trees that you already have planted here? Every year uh, in the parks budget, we have $7,500 just to plant trees. 
Um, and in 2018, I applied for a grant through the Minnesota DNR, um, Improving Community Forestry, I believe was what the grant was called. Um, and we were chosen for that. And um, we received just under $20,000. Um, which we planted 119 new trees that were inch and a half caliper or bigger. I mean, good sized trees. Um, as well as with that grant, we bought um, watering bags for all the trees, mulch, um, and uh, attachment for skid loader to help auger in these holes um, for the trees to be planted in. So. Was that for a one-year grant then, or a couple of years? Um, that was a one-year grant. It started in 18, and then uh, we had uh, a timeline to, to meet by the middle of summer of 19 to have the funds used or expended, um, and then submit all of our paperwork for reimbursement. Um, so, But the, the tree bags are reusable, um, so we took them off before winter, and uh, the new plantings for this year, they're already on. Um, as well as the auger we can use for many years to come. So, How did you decide what trees to plant and order for that project? Um, after doing this for a few years, uh, we, I'm pretty familiar with the soils we have in certain parks, um, which definitely makes a difference. Uh, and we also just know what grows well in Marshall, whether it's, you know, trees that need wind protection or don't mind clay or only like the black loamy soil. Um, so we kind of base it off of that, where we're planning to go and what would fit that area well. But you ordered numerous species, I believe, right? Yep. Um, I th think there was eight or nine different species, um, like locusts, hackberry, oak, the new elms, crabapple, um, Kentucky coffee tree, um, just to name a few. I think I left out a few. But. Well, that's okay. <laughs> you went for diversity anyway. Yep, yep. And n other than... Uh, some birch, which I didn't mention, mention, we did put those in more of a clump, um, but otherwise uh, any of the plantings, there were no two, two same trees planted next to each other. You got them in all at one time, I would assume. Where did you put them or hold them before you could get them all planted? Um, at the park maintenance shop. We just have a big parking lot and the pool wasn't open, so we just staged them out in the parking lot. And then uh, we have a watering truck, um, so we would just water as needed depending on wind, temp, rain, stuff like that until we could get them in the ground and then once we had them planted we just watered twice a week, filled those tree watering bags. So, Did, did they come in bare root or were they in containers? Uh, containers. Oh, okay. All right. Well then you have a little bit more of a time leeway there. Did you do all of the planting or did you involve community groups in doing the planting too? Yeah, um, the goal was to use um, mainly volunteers, but with last summer being so wet, we kind of ran into some um, timelines with the deadline of the grant and when we could get the um, trees in the ground from, uh, you know, getting a skid loader out on the turf and stuff like that. Um, so we ended up, I think we had like 16 volunteer hours and then the rest the uh, park staff did. Okay, and you bought some equipment even too to help with all of that planting. Yes, that's correct. Uh, we, we bought a postal auger that went on the skid loader um, with multiple different auger sizes depending on the tree um, size in the pot. Um, and it helped loosen that soil good and we went bigger than the, we needed so that we had some good loose soil um, to put the the pot into when we were done. So That's what I was going to ask because sometimes when you have an auger it kind of scarifies the wall and makes it pretty glazed. Did you have to break that up a little bit when planting? Yeah we, we did that too in combination of uh, going considerably larger than what we actually needed to so we had a good six seven inches around the outside that was nice and loose. So, Did you add any compost or peat at all when you did the planting? Um, we did not do that. We just put the native soils that were in the area back um, but we did do like a root stimulator on all of them um, and then mulch around all of them as well. We do that for all of our new tree plantings. That's what I was going to ask if you mulched around those new plantings too. Yep, for the first couple of years we'll maintain it and then once we know that, you know, year three or four, we'll kind of let the mulch just kind of go away or as it fades or breaks down, we just don't replace it. So. What did you use for mulch? Um, we get mulch out of the cities. Um, it's just a hardwood stained mulch. Um, you know, you get a good 
two, three years coverage and color out of some of it. So. Okay. Did you have to do a lot of reporting back on the grant application to show what you did or um, did you have to submit pictures and things like that too? Yes, we did. Uh, we kept track of all invoices, uh, maps of the different parks that we planted them in or areas and those maps included uh, what species was planted where um, and then there was an inspector that came out and looked and verified and that they're planted correctly and stuff like that um, and that was all good and okayed um, and then we had to submit all that paperwork back as well as like hours staff spent doing it um, the, the tree species and stuff like I mentioned um, everything was okayed and it was just a great benefit to the community for future years to come. So, Did you have pretty good survival rate on all those trees you planted? Yes, out of the 119 trees, I believe we had four that didn't come out of the winter. Um, so in my opinion, that would be a highly successful uh, rate um, and we'll get those replaced yet this summer, but maybe wait till fall now. Um, and then we'll get those four replaced also. So, Did you tree put tree wraps on the uh, trees at all to protect against the critters? We don't normally have any problems with that. I mean, I've seen it very rarely. Um, more of our issue is the wind. Um, so some of them that were susceptible, we did stake. So the trees behind us do have wraps on. Those came um, from the, the nursery that way. We don't apply any wraps to the trees ourselves. When you do planting, do you plant on private homeowners' lots also? Um, at this time, we only plant on city property, city-owned property, whether that's in parks or I do have two areas um, that we've started kind of like a tree farm um, that we let mainly evergreens grow. Um, and then when they get, you know, six, eight, ten feet tall, we'll go and spade and move them somewhere else. Um, in the future, I know some cities are considering doing like a tree replacement program for the ash and when emerald ash borer gets to their community, so that might be some kind of program that might exist. I'm just not sure what that would look like at this time. So. Well, thank you for all of your help and for all of the great advice in dealing with Emerald Ash Borer coming down the road. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided by Heartland Motor Company, providing service to Minnesota and the Dakotas for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering ASIRA, pioneers in bringing state-of-the-art technology to our rural communities. Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. And by friends of Prairie Yard and Garden, a community of supporters like you who engage in the long-term growth of the series. To become a friend of Prairie Yard and Garden, visit pioneer.org forward slash PYG.